Hi everyone, thanks for joining me once again. This is Peter, you're watching Thailand Bound. And today I'm gonna to be reading out three viewers' stories. Uh, the first two are quite long. The last one, the third one is very, very short. Okay, so just before I get into these stories today, I've had some people ask me about the diet video I'm gonna make. As you guys, if you've been following my channel, you know I've lost quite a lot of weight since June, about 21 kilos so far. That's 3.3 stone. Uh, I think, I don't know what it is in pounds, about 42 maybe. And uh, I said I was going to make a video on how I did it. I haven't been on any uh, serious exercise regimes or any particular diets. I've just done it in my own way. You know, I'm 62 in April, so I'm sure there's older guys who are going to watch this who've got a bit of a beer belly. Maybe they want to lose a bit of weight. And I'm just going to try and help you out with some tips. But I've got about another four kilos to go. I want to get down 25 kilos. Uh, I'm on track for the end of November. So once I get down, I will be putting out that video. Okay, so let's get straight on with these three stories today. This first one is something a little bit different. I haven't read a story out like this before. It's self-explanatory. So let me just start and uh, see what you guys think of the first story today. Hi, Peter. I'm a new subscriber to your channel as I love a good old car crash story as I too experienced a bad breakup with a Thai woman. But I'll leave that story for another time. The story I'm about to tell you is not your typical Patia Bar Girl story, but it does have some moral ethics behind it. A little bit about myself. My name is Mac and I'm from South Australia. My father is Chinese and my mother is Thai. They always spoke in English because neither of them spoke each other's language. I was pretty much raised as an Australian country boy as at the time it was 1989. There were no other Asian kids at my school. I finished high school in South Australia, but attended a university in Canberra as a young adult. That's where I met a Thai friend called Pamit. He was from Chiang Mai and was furthering his English studies here as he wanted to speak better English. He was so happy he met me because I was the only other Asian at the university and I was half Thai. After we got to know each other a little bit more, he was so shocked at how little Thai I spoke and knew next to nothing about my culture. It worked out eventually because Pamit's English improved dramatically and my knowledge of Thailand also improved, or so I thought. Pamit's English course finished in 2002, so he went back to Thailand. We kept in touch through international phone cards back then. I made him a promise that I would come to visit him in Thailand after I finished my studies. In the blink of an eye, it was 2004. I've just graduated and off I went to meet Pamit in Chiang Mai. Although I'm half Thai, I have never travelled to the Land of Smiles before. This will be my first trip. Pamit came to pick me up from Chiang Mai Airport. He explained some of the do's and don'ts and told me that I won't get away with everything a foreigner would get away with due to me looking like one of the locals. He took me to his house where I met his mother and sister. To my surprise, they both spoke English more fluently than he does. I soon learned that both were English teachers in one of the local universities. Pamit explained to me what our two-week program was and I was very excited to get started. He said we'll be riding motorcycles through the Mei Hong Son Loop. Pamit, being a motorcycle enthusiast, had a Harley, as well as a few other racing bikes and scooters for me to choose from. I chose to take a, Vesk, a Vespa as I'm, not, as I'm a novice rider and Pamit brought his Harley. At 7am, I woke up, got ready and came downstairs to have breakfast with his mother and sister. His mother reminded him to make merit when he got to a certain location on our trip. I don't really understand what she meant at the time, but Pamit said he'll explain it later. We both headed out with our motorcycles, stopping along various sites to take photos or use the restrooms. Three hours into the trip, we stop at a village called Om Khoi. He said we'll, we'll be spending the night in one of the guest houses and we had to go shopping to buy various gifts like blankets, books, t-shirts, chocolates and some toys. I asked why we were buying these items and he replied to make merit. He said we will be making a short trip up the mountains to a poor village to do donate all these items to the people living there. He explained to me about Thai traditions on merit which I sort of understand at the time. I gave him an extra 5,000 baht to buy more things as I too wanted to make merit. After we bought all the stuff, a pickup truck came to pick us up to go up the mountain. 
I jump on the back and as I've never rolled on the back before because it was illegal in Australia, it wasn't as much fun as I expected it to be due to it being very rough terrain going up the mountain. My back and my backside were so sore from the ride that it was a huge relief to see that we had arrived at the village. Pamit had a cheeky smirk on his face as he asked me how my backside felt from the ride up. I smiled and said it was okay. As we arrived, almost every child from the village came to greet us. I was shocked to see how many small, skinny and dirty all these kids were. I remember feeling so sorry for them as I looked around the village to see such poor living conditions that these people were living in. Soon after we were greeted by the village elders, Pamit and I handed all the blankets and clothes over to them and their people. As for the toys, Pamit told the kids to line up in a single file as I handed out dolls to the girls, cars and toy guns to the boys. I was proud of what I had done as we brought so many smiles into these people's lives. The village elders told us that they will put on a feast for us tonight in the village centre and they will not take no for an answer. Pamit hesitated as he agreed and explained to me what was going on. I was full of enthusiasm as I've only seen these types of celebrations on TV. They roasted a pig over the hot charcoal. My mouth was watering watching the pig go round and round. Pamit whispered to me and said, look, I know you're hungry because we haven't eaten since noon, but don't eat what they give you because your stomach won't be able to handle the bacteria. Stupid old me didn't take any of Pamit's advice as I bit into the delicious suckling pig and washed it down with some of the homemade white wine made from rice. Pamit pretended to eat the pork throughout the night. I didn't take much notice as I was really enjoying myself. We both got drunk that we, we we both got that drunk that we had to stay and sleep in one of the spare huts. In the morning, we both woke up at around 7 a.m., hungover and not really remembering much about the night before. As we packed our bags and came outside, some of the villagers were already outside our hut to see us off. We said our goodbye our goodbyes as we made our way down the mountain in the pickup truck. Pamit told the driver to stop just outside the village and he showed me these little huts that had a hole in the middle of the floor. Under the hole there were buckets. Pamit told me that these are the toilets that the villagers use. As the truck kept driving we drove past a pigsty. Pamit asked me, do you remember those buckets? That's the reason why I didn't want you to eat the pigs last night. He explains they feed the pigs with their poo. Suddenly my stomach just turned and I threw up over the side of the truck. I asked him why he didn't tell me. He replied, I did, you idiot. You were so drunk that you ignored me. We didn't speak much as we rested in our guest house until the next day. The next day, as we were getting ready to get to our next destination, we didn't speak about what had happened yesterday. We just acted like nothing happened, which was fine with me because I really didn't want to be reminded about it. We rode for about another two hours and we got to a beautiful village which was a tourist attraction as it had bars, a bus stop, many restaurants, a market, temples and the most beautiful rice fields you'll ever see. As Pamit was checking us into the guest house, I went alone to see the scenery and took photos of the locals. We ate at a local restaurant that I chose. I picked it because it was clean and the waitress was so beautiful. As we were eating, Pamit got a phone call from a distant relative nearby. He asked if he would like to come to his bar tonight as he hasn't seen Pamit in many years. We arrived at his bar at 8 p.m. We only had brought the Vespa as we didn't want to wake the locals if we were going to be going home late. We were treated with the nicest hospitality from his staff. For the next five hours, we were treated like kings. We stayed until the bar shut at 2 a.m. I was so drunk that I couldn't see properly. Pamit was not too drunk, so we decided to ride the Vespa back to the guest house, which was only 10 minutes away across the rice fields. I jumped on the back, and as we drove along the rice fields, suddenly I had to pee. I told Pamit to pull over as I couldn't hold it any longer. Pamit pulled over the side of the rice field. I ran straight to the field, unzipped my jeans. It was pitch black and there were no lights anywhere. Suddenly, Pamit was screaming at me, but being so drunk, I couldn't make out what he was saying. As I walked back to the bike, Pamit continued screaming. I asked him what he was so angry about. He replied, you idiot, of all the places you could have taken a leak, why did you have to do it on the small wooden shrine? Thais have small shrines in their homes for worship. 
Sometimes they can be found in rice fields, the workplace, most hotels and re resorts or just along the road. It can be used to worship dead relatives or just random ghosts that occupy the area. I didn't know what it was and if I knew I, co I couldn't see it, I wouldn't have done it anyway. Pamit was angry and didn't speak to me the whole night. The next day, he was still a little angry as he only spoke to me when he needed to. This part of the story is where things got a little weird. As we were driving out of the village, Pamit was riding fast and I tried to keep up. Suddenly, I felt a strong gust of wind and lost control of the bike and fell head first onto the road. My helmet flew off my head as I landed. Luckily, the helmet broke my fall as it came off afterwards. The bike continued to slide off the road and into the rice field. The next thing I knew, I could hear Pamit calling my name and asking me if I was okay. The first thing that came out of my mouth as I was laying on the side of the road covered in blood was, is the bike okay? Pamit got a towel from his bike and wiped some of the blood off my face. He asked if I could get up and walk as he wanted to take me to the nearest clinic. When we got to the clinic, the doctor examined me thoroughly. Luckily, I escaped with just minor cuts to the face and scrapes on the body. I went inside the restrooms to clean the blood off my face and as I came out, the doctor, the nurse, the receptionist and Pamet were all looking at me like I've just killed somebody. He explained to me that what I did last night was unforgivable, that it was the reason why this accident occurred. I just rubbished it off and blamed the accident on my lack of experience on a bike and that it could happen to anyone. Pamet shook his head and just paid for the bill. I hop, hopped back on the bike as we needed to retrieve the Vespa stuck in the rice fields. When we got to the location of the accident, Pamit pointed out that it wasn't a coincidence that I had the accident there. It was the same location of the shrine that I had peed on last night. He continued saying that I must make things right, I must make things right or bad things won't stop happening. The only problem is he doesn't know how. He said when we get back to Chiang Mai, he will ask his mother about it. When we got back to Chiang Mai, I told Pamit that I wanted to stay in a hotel because I didn't want to be a bother to his family. He dropped me off at a hotel and asked me not to do anything stupid. He will try to get some advice on how to fix our little problem. I rested for a few hours until about 7pm. I logged onto the internet to see what was good in Chiang Mai and decided to head to the night bazaar for some dinner. I called Pamit and he said he'll meet me there as he had an appointment with a friend. I got a taxi on the side of the road and he took me straight to my destination. I've never in my life seen so many people in one place at the same time. I was so amazed at the uh, scenery and to be honest, I was a little overwhelmed as I'm a guy from a quiet town. I went into a bar where I saw a lot of falang and ordered some food and beer and I waited for my friend. A few hours went by and I was getting bored so I called the waitress over to get my cheque. When the bill arrived, I checked my pockets to get my wallet out and it was nowhere to be seen. The last time I saw it when, was when I paid the taxi driver. I must have dropped it in the cab or on the street. Feeling a bit embarrassed, I told the waitress that I had a change of heart and decided to stay for a few more beers and wait for my friend to join me. 20 minutes later, Pamit arrived. I told him that I've lost my wallet. With a big sigh, he told me we'll have to report it to the police station. When we left the police station, Pamit said he had a surprise for me. He took me to a place with a VIP room. Inside the room, there was a private bar, a pool table, and a huge TV screen for some singing. Two minutes later, an older lady came along with 10 or 12 pretty girls. Pamit told me to pick one to sit with me. I was so shy as I've never seen anything like this before. I couldn't even stare at the girls' faces, yet alone pick one. Pamit understood the situation and picked two girls to sit with us. They were both so beautiful I wasn't bothered. The night went by as we drank, played pool and sang. The bar was closing and we had to pay the bill. Pamit asked if I wanted one of them to come back to the hotel with me. I replied only if she wants to. Pamit went and negotiated something with her and she agreed to come back with me. We left the establishment and headed straight to my hotel. Suddenly a car rammed him from behind. The owner of the vehicle got out and apologised to Pamit, Pamit, admitting it was his fault. They exchanged details and both went their separate ways. Pamit dropped us off at the front of the lobby. He gave me strict instructions not to wander off by myself the next day until he arrives. The girl was holding my hand as we took the lift to the fifth floor, where I was staying. 
The lift stopped on the first floor. I didn't think anything of it. I just pressed the closed door button. Again, it stopped on the second floor. No one got in, so I pressed the button again. Once again, it stopped on the third floor and the door opened. The girl with me started to come closer and closer to me as she held my arm tight. I told her that we will take the stairs back down and talk to the receptionist. I told him that the lifts are stopping on every level without anyone getting in. He came inside the lift with us, pressed level five. The lift took us all the way up to level five without stopping at any other floor. I thought it was strange, but it was probably just all a coincidence. When we got back to my room, the girl didn't say much. She just sat there and looked around the room. I asked her what was wrong. She said she's getting weird feelings and goosebumps on the back of her neck. She asked me if she could cancel our arrangement as she didn't want to stay one more minute in this room. I didn't want to force her to stay if she didn't want to. She reached in her bag, took out a few thousand baht and placed it on the table. She then ran out the door without saying a word. I called Panit, Pamit and told him what had happened. He just said, don't worry about it. Tomorrow I'm taking you to the temple, he said. The next day at 10 a.m., Pamit arrived to pick me up. We drove to a temple recommended by his friend. When we got there, he told me not to say anything and just do what he does. So I followed the ritual as best as I could without Pamit explaining anything to the monk. The monk said that he's really angry at your friend for his arrogance. I was baffled as a monk and Pamit tried their best to explain the situation to me. Apparently, I have a spirit following me around which was causing all this bad luck. The only way to fix it is to bathe in holy water and to go back to the shrine with an offering and apology for my mistake. I didn't want this to ruin my holiday, so I agreed to follow these steps. After I bathed in holy water, we drove for three hours back to the shrine where it all started. Pamit placed some fruit, sweets and some red drink on the bottom of the shrine. He burnt some incest for us and told me to repeat after him and place the incest on the ground next to the food. The rest of my holiday went very quickly without any problems and I did return home safely. I learned an important lesson from that trip. Not only should I respect Thai laws, but to also respect Thai beliefs and customs. I haven't seen Pamit in five years. I can't wait until this pandemic is over so I can't visit him again. I know it was a long story and a little far-fetched for your viewers, but every word is true. Thanks for everyone for listening. So I don't know what you made of that one, guys. It was, uh, like I said, it was a little bit different. Um, the Thais are very, very religious, as we all know, and you know those spirit houses, they are everywhere, and you, you should always be very, very respectful um, of the religion there. Um, this, it could have been a series of coincidences, the bad luck. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about it to give a, a, an educated opinion. You have to make your own minds up on that one. Okay, on to story number two, and Saturday morning stories wouldn't be the same without a good old bar girl story, and we're going to do one for you right now. Firstly, a little bit about myself so I can paint the backdrop for this story. I'm an average looking American guy in my mid-30s and was on my first trip to Thailand. I had heard stories of Pattaya from a friend, and as a gift to myself, I decided to finally go and book my trip right after New Year. I flew into Bangkok and was going to be in Thailand for a little over two weeks. After a few nights of visiting the Gogo bars in Nana Plaza, I headed down to Pattaya. What a culture shock. I was not used to the handsome man catcalls every 20 feet. I really thought that this type of attention would be enjoyable, but truthfully, I now see why women find this off-putting. However, after a few more days, a person can adapt to their surroundings. I had been hitting the Gogo bars on Walking Street every night and I am bar finding a different girl each night to drink and play pool with. After about a week, I go into a bar I have never been to, which I found is quite famous on Walking Street. If you do a little research, you will know which gogo bar I am referring to. This gogo bar is unlike any other I went to. Here in the States, all clubs have a keep your hands to yourselves type of rule regarding the dancers. This place, to put it mildly, had no such rule. If I was uncomfortable with catcalls, you can imagine what I seen there I found rather disturbing. I left after about only 20 minutes, but as I said, you get used to just about anything in time. So a couple of days later, I thought, why not check out that place again? Which brings me to the main character of the story. I never did get her name, but well, we'll just call her Hot Mess, or M for short. 
I called her hot mess because out of all the girls in the bars, 70 to 100, she was a superstar. She was also a bubbly mess, so hot mess. Bleach blonde hair, five foot tall and a perfect figure. I called her over and bought her a drink. Now I drink margaritas normally, but trying to find a place that serves margaritas in Thailand is like trying to find water in the desert. You can find it, but you really must search. So I must resort to shots of tequila. Also, as this is relevant to the story, I have a rather high tolerance for alcohol, and if I don't keep drinking once I've started when I'm out, I will very quickly lose my mood. This isn't really a problem because I can hold my alcohol and unless you really know me, most people can't tell when I'm drunk. So we have a few shots and I ask her to leave the bar with me. The most enjoyable part of the evening for me is partying and playing pool in the bars on Beach Road with the girls. M tells me she cannot keep me company for more than a couple of hours or so. I have a pretty good buzz on and I really want to see her so I take her for a couple of hours and a good time is had by all. Fast forward two days and I really want to see her again. I go back to her bar, but she is with another guy. I decide to have a few drinks and hand back and see how the situation develops. After a little while, he leaves and she comes and sits next to me. I buy another round and tell her I want to take her out again. But this time I want to take her out for the evening, not just a couple of hours. She again says she only goes out for a few hours. M told me that if I paid two bar fines, she could keep me company for the entire evening, which worked for me. Now this part is key to the story. No money has changed hands between M and I, so this is where our evening started. She said she had not eaten yet and asked if she could eat some noodles that the manager had bought for the girls and were waiting for her in the girls' changing room. She tells me that after we eat, we can leave together. I wanted to enjoy M's company and hadn't eaten yet myself, so I offered to take her to a seafood restaurant on the waterfront. I thought it was certainly better than noodles from a seller's cart on the street. M said, no, it's fine. The noodles will be fine and will save me money. I said that I really didn't mind and I would be happy to take her out for a good meal. She again declined and I said, okay, I would wait for her. About 20 minutes later, she comes out all smiles and is ready to go. We go to another go-go bar together as she doesn't play pool but wants to drink. That suits me just fine. We have a few shots and rank the girls on stage by hottest. We're both laughing and having a good time. I tell her she is prettier than all of them to which she is positively beaming. What girl doesn't like flattery? After an hour or so, she's, she wants to take me to another bar her friends work at. I knew immediately this is going to be a costly night if I decide to go. But at this point, I have a good buzz, so I don't really care about the money. So we head off to the next bar. She sees her friends and around four to five girls huddle around us. She asks for me to buy them all a ladies drink, which I'm happy to do. We all talk and laugh for around 20 minutes and after each girl finishes her drink, they thank me and leave me and Em alone. I thought that was extremely nice that none of them, including Em, did not try and pressure me for more lady drinks and were happy with just one each. Em is also happy as she gained face for bringing in a customer to buy drinks for all of her friends. So about 10 minutes later, we change go-go's again and are laughing and holding hands on the way. At this next go-go bar, we both really enjoy the music and I have a couple more shots. As I am, join as I am enjoying the view, I notice so is Em. It is at this point I'm starting to think I'm not the only one of us that likes girls, but the night is getting costly enough already without thinking such things. So I pay the bill and we leave. As we are leaving, I realize I am at the perfect level of drunk. Not too much that I will be sick, but enough that I will be able to maintain my buzz for the rest of the night without having to do any more shots. Em is also not too drunk and in great spirits as we have been laughing and joking all night and I made her look good in front of her friends. I thought what a perfect time to end the evening and go back to my hotel. I'm also keenly aware that good vibes can quickly turn to bad when someone's been drinking, so why risk ruining the evening when so far it's been great? I was now hungry and wanted to take M to that restaurant on the waterfront. Against my better judgment, I asked her if she would like to go and she happily said yes. So after a short walk, we arrive and are seated. We have had a chance to look over the menu and I give the waitress our orders. As we are waiting for our food, it was around this time that I notice her mood begins to change. 
She's getting a little short tempered and I could tell the vibe wasn't the same. I had a feeling this might happen if we continued the night, but it was still just a vibe and I held out hope that her mood will again change and will be all smiles again. Unfortunately, this did not happen. I am soon finding that anything I say is taken negatively. This goes on for around 10 minutes or so and I am quickly seeing any hopes of a fun night evaporating before my eyes. As a last minute idea, I attempt to spin something she said into a funny joke to make her laugh. She just stares at me and says, don't say that. She stays quiet for a few more seconds as I try to think of what else I could do to lighten the mood. Then she says, why you no let me eat? I asked her, what? I didn't understand what she was referring to. She says, at the beginning of the night, why you not let me eat noodles? I told her I was trying to be nice and wanted to take her to a night for a nice meal. She then said I was a bad man for not wanting her to eat. I sat there for a few seconds not knowing what to say. Then she broke the silence and said she didn't want to stay with me. Well, that was just fine with me. There was no salvage in the night and it's no fun being with someone that doesn't want to be there. So I told her I understand and I wished her a good night. She sat there for a few seconds then reached into her purse and pull, pulled out 3,000 baht, handed it to me, then she got up and left. I looked down at the money and then back up at her walking away, not knowing what was going on. Apparently neither did the staff as our server and another server were right next to the table with our food watching this slow motion car wreck play out. I just looked at them and then shrugged my shoulders. What could I say? Now I only paid 1000 baht to the bar. I hadn't paid M any money so why had she given me 3000 baht? I have no idea. She was with me the entire time, so she seen what I paid to the bar. I don't know if I am the only one in Patia, but if not, I am part of a select few that could say that at the end of the night, after a bar fine and a go-go dancer, the go-go dancer actually paid for the evening. Not bad for an average looking guy's first trip to Thailand. Looking back on it, I can see it was funny, but at the time I felt like an idiot. What kind of a jerk do you have to be for a go-go dancer to pay you to leave? So I finished my food and was going to call it a night. I had been royally rejected by a go-go dancer and my ego was on the floor. But then it hit me. How bad could the night get? It had to be an uphill from there, right? So I went out, met another girl I had previously met and bar find her with M's money. So a short story with a happy ending, but I still don't know why M was so upset with me. So I don't know, that seems to me like uh, some communication problems there. Now obviously this guy we've got the story he invited her for a nice seafood dinner but she had her noodles and i think she didn't quite understand i think what this girl m thought was that he was just saying no forget your noodles let's go she kind of let that slip had a good night out but once the drink started to wear off or wear it into the brain a bit more she started niggling away at her and i think that's why she got upset and kind of walked off why did she give him 3,000 baht? It can only be one of two things. Either she made a mistake uh, because she wasn't thinking straight or she wanted to show him, look, you know, you've paid for drinks all night. I don't want nothing from you. There's 3,000 baht to cover the lot uh, because it doesn't bother me. It's a, a big uh, face then, isn't it? So uh, uh, not, not a great situation. Right, I'm going to go straight into the third story. This is very, very short. This is a continuation of a story that I've read out previously. I can't remember which one it is. I hope you guys can. Uh, it's real short. Let me just read it and see if you can get uh, get get to the uh, the gist of it, as it were. I came back to Thailand via the Phuket sandbox on July the 17th and stayed in Phuket up until now because it simply made no sense to move to a dark red zone with harsh restrictions and a nine o'clock curfew. I had chatted a couple of times with a girl called Nim and she said that she was keen to meet me when I made it to Bangkok. September 15, I flew from Phuket to Bangkok and Nim got off work at 5 p.m. She has a job at a bank. She came to my hotel at 7 p.m. We went out to dinner and then went back and then she treated me to the best aerobics that I think I've ever had in my life. We repeated this the next night except she said that she didn't need dinner. Neither of us liked to eat at night. Again, the best aerobics and around two in the wee hours. Friday, we took the day off from each other, but had a plan to spend Saturday at Icon Siam shopping mall. The more time that we spent together, the more I realized that I really do not want to continue seeing Nim. She was still a pretty woman, not a reference to the movie, but had gained a kilo or so and seemed to have aged a lot more. 
I know at this point I may sound like a jerk, but I know how I am. I know that at some point I'm going to want someone else. At Icon CM, while having noodles, I had a conversation with him that went something like this. I don't want to be like one of those guys who have broken your heart. I'm not going to stay in Bangkok. I want to live in Pattaya. So I am not going to make you my girlfriend. I really like you and I want to keep seeing you. I hope that we can stay friends and see each other when I'm here or if you visit Pattaya. She agreed and seemed happy that I had that, com that conversation with her and tried to keep things honest. At 2 p.m. I sent her home in a taxi and took my own to my hotel. She asked me if she should come to my hotel room later. I told her, no, I have to meet my American friend. She seemed disappointed and, I, and later sent me a message online, which I did not really understand, but I think that she could tell that it was the end. And, and that's all there is to that story, really, guys. Um, just once again, guys, if you sent me a story, be patient. I've got loads now. I can always use some more, but unless you've received an email from me telling you that I can't use a story, then you will hear it eventually. Uh, the runtime is about a month uh, to six weeks at the moment. Okay, guys, that's it for today. Uh, another three stories. There'll be more stories next Saturday. Uh, I'll see you again for the live stream on Friday at 9pm UK time. Until then, thanks for listening to me again.